Well, Father, we thank you that you loved us enough to send your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, into this world to live the life that we couldn't live, a perfect life, a sinless life. And Father, we thank you for doing that. We praise you. We thank you for raising him from the dead, and we celebrate it because without the empty tomb, there is no church. So we ask you now to bless our time together as we open your word. May your spirit talk to us, meet our needs, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I hope you still have your Bibles open to Luke chapter 24. If not, please turn back there. Luke chapter 24. I don't remember how long ago it was. A month, six weeks, somewhere back there, we had the leaders of the church over to our house, the leaders and their spouses, for just a thank you dinner for the job that they do here in the church. Whenever something, whenever there's a need, whenever we need somebody to volunteer for something, they're quick to volunteer, their wives are quick to volunteer, they are there for you. And that's, that's rare. We don't have that in all the churches. So I, it's just our way of saying thank you to them for the service that they give you and the great attitude that they have in serving the cause of Christ. We always do something to just kind of help us get to know each other a little better. So after dinner, we sat around in the living room and I asked them a question. I said, if you could go back in time to anywhere in the Bible, where would you want to go? How would you answer that question today? If you could go back anywhere in Scripture, where would you want to go? And there were some great answers that came out, and it was thrilling to hear. Some would want it to be in Genesis chapter 1 when the world was created. Where would you want to be? Would you want to be in Genesis chapter 3 as the serpent is tempting Adam and Eve? And would you want to stand there and cry out and say, no, don't do it, don't do that? Would you want to be in Genesis chapter 22 where Abraham was told to sacrifice his son Isaac and he has the knife up in the air and he's about to drive it down into his son and God stopped him and said, no, don't do that. Would you want to see that? What would you want to see? Well, the, where, I, where I got that idea from was I was with a pastor here in Greenville a number of years ago and he said if he could go back in time and be anywhere in the Bible, he would want to be in the passage that we are looking at this morning, the road to Emmaus, as Jesus himself explains the Old Testament to these two men that are here. So that's where he would want to go. And that's what we're dealing with today. So today we're going to hear the greatest teacher in the world explain the greatest book in the world. And it's interesting because his story is only found in Luke. Luke wasn't one of the people that saw Jesus after he rose from the dead, but he was a scientist. He was a historian and he had an inquiring mind. You can read about that in the first few verses of his gospel. So let's pick it up with verse 13. And behold, two of them were going that very day to a village named Emmaus, which is about seven miles from Jerusalem. So it starts off, behold, so there's some change is going to take place here. Something new, something unexpected is about to happen. We have two men. Now, these men are followers of Jesus. We do not know who they are. We do know their condition. As a follower of Christ, these men are heartbroken. They're confused. They're devastated. And maybe that's where you are today, because life doesn't change. They left their dreams back in Jerusalem. They left their dreams dead and buried in Jerusalem. And now for these two men, it's back to the real world. So these men are going home after a very long, hard weekend. But notice what the Bible says. That very day. What day? Easter Sunday, the day we're celebrating today, the Easter Sunday is drawing to a close that day, the day the empty tomb was discovered. So we have two disciples here, two followers of Jesus. They're not named. We do not know who they are. What we do know is that they love Jesus. Now, were they there when he rode into the city and people were cheering? Did they cheer him? They believed that he was the Messiah, 
Maybe they even watched him die. We don't know. Verse 14. And they were talking with each other about all these things which had taken place. Now they're talking. The verb there means they're kicking ideas back and forth with a lot of emotion involved. And of course there would be. We can just imagine what they're talking about. What in the world just happened? How can something that was going so well have turned so bad so quickly? And they're talking about what happened in Jerusalem. They're trying to work through all of this. They have a lot to talk about. What could they talk about? They could talk about Judas who walked with Jesus and then turned on him and betrayed him. They could talk about the Sanhedrin, what they did. Pilate, his part. Calvary. They believed that Jesus was the Messiah. Maybe they watched him die from a distance. Was our hope in vain? Did Jesus trick us? Did he fool us? They've heard rumors about a resurrection. They've heard about the fact of the empty tomb. The Bible says all of these things, everything that happened in the week in Jerusalem concerning Jesus, the crowds, the empty tomb. All right, verse 15. When they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself approached and began traveling with them. So Jesus himself joins their journey. Now, as far as they know, this is just another man, a stranger on the road to Emmaus. Verse 16. But their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. Prevented from recognizing him. This is a passive in the Greek, meaning the action here is God himself. God himself is preventing these men from recognizing Jesus Christ. And this is amazing. And I would just throw out to you without being too dogmatic. I think there are times in our lives when we might do the very same thing. Maybe there's an angel there. Maybe Jesus is there and we don't know it. We don't recognize it. Now, this should be comforting for you, I hope, because we go through things just like these two men are going through. We go through trials. We go through sorrow. We suffer. There are times we feel alone. We're, by our, we're on our own. No one else is there. No one cares. And we need to pray, Lord, open my eyes. So somehow Jesus comes up to them and he did not identify himself. Now, the word recognize here means an exclusive discovery based on facts. Now, verse 17, Jesus himself joins the discussion with a question. Verse 17. And he said to them, now, if folks, this is almost funny. If it wasn't so serious, this could be funny. He said to them, what are these words that you're exchanging with one another as you're walking? And they stood still. They stopped looking sad. So what are you guys talking about? They're talking about whether Jesus' life was a success or a failure and what their future now holds. Because their whole future was tied to Jesus and those plans have been destroyed. Now, in that day when a king died, the hope of the people would die with the king. Their king, Jesus hung cold and dead on a Roman cross in Jerusalem and was buried. And now his enemies have declared victory, and it's back to business as usual. But for the followers of Christ, their dreams died that day. So they're sad. They're confused. Now, I want you to notice, as far as an application, I want you to notice how weak and imperfect a believer's knowledge of the Bible can be and still be saved and still be saved. So Jesus is counseling them. And I've said many times, every sermon should be a counseling session. We're going to learn a lot how to counsel people, deal with people, how to deal with our own problems today. Jesus is counseling them. We need to learn from this. He lets these men express themselves. He lets them pour out their hearts to him. And a good teacher will ask a lot of questions. Verse 18. So one of them named Cleopas answered and said to him, 
Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem and unaware of the things which have happened in these days? And we don't know who this man is. Could he be Luke's source for the story? It's only found in Luke. Did Luke run into this man somewhere down the road? But look at what the man says to Jesus. Are you the only one that doesn't know what's going on around here? Now, folks, if there's anyone who knew what was going on, it was Jesus. And I can imagine for the next 20, 30, 40 years, whatever it may be, as people read this story, I think some of them are going to start laughing. If there was anyone who understood what had happened in Jerusalem, it's this stranger, Jesus. These guys don't have a clue. So now Jesus has a follow-up question in verses 19 and 20. And he said to them, what things? And they said to him, the things about Jesus, the Nazarene, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word in the sight of God and all the people, and how the chief priest and our rulers delivered him to the sentence of death and crucified him. Now they're troubled, but they're also amazed. Now Jesus here acts like a good counselor. He lets these men get their problem out into the open. Now notice the last part of the verse. This is what I'm calling the gospel according to Cleopas. And he does a pretty good job. Look at it. About Jesus of the Nazarene, who was a prophet mighty indeed in word and a sight of God and all the people. That's a good description of Jesus' ministry. But he doesn't understand the purpose of Jesus' ministry. So he gives us a description of Jesus the prophet, mighty indeed, mighty in words, good stuff. Heaven spoke, this is my son. Notice how his feelings just come pouring out. Same thing with Mary and Martha when they were at the tomb and with many of the people in this gospel. These two men, these two believers are standing at this moment somewhere between unbelief and faith. Somewhere between the two. The gospel according to Cleopas has all the facts that you would expect to find in a gospel of a man, a sinner. But notice how patient Jesus is in dealing with this man. And we can learn. He listens and he lets him tell him what he already knows. Jesus already knows all this. One thing we can learn from this lesson today. If, you, if you've got a problem with someone, you're upset with someone, you've got to talk to them about something, you want to correct the situation. If you can't talk to them using the fruit of the Spirit, don't do it. Hold off. Wait. Get the emotion out of it. And then when you can use the fruit of the Spirit in talking to someone, then go ahead and do it. Because Jesus is doing that here. We're seeing great patience. Patience is part of the fruit of the Spirit. I want to list, read to you uh, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And Jesus is telling us to do the very same thing. Come, talk to me. You might as well, because he already knows what's on your mind. He already knows your heart. He knows your heart better than I do, better than you do. So you might as well just find a time and just pour out your problem to the Lord, because he's inviting you to come and do that. All right, verse 21. But we were hoping. Now, I want to stop there for just a second. Expectations. You've heard me say this before. Expectations are a dangerous thing. If you have expectations of your husband, your wife, your children, your best friend, whoever it may be, and they don't know what your expectations are, you're going to be hurt, and they're, going to, they're not going to have a clue about what's going on. That's what we're seeing here. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, it's the third day since these things happened. Now, the Jews thought that if a person, if he was still alive when he was buried or something like that, that they would come back by the third day. If it's the third day, it's too late. It's all over. So they're saying here, this is the third day since these things happened. It, it's, it's too late. All right, verse 21. But we were 
hoping. We had hoped there's disappointment here. Now, these men are going through a crisis in their life. What good is a dead Messiah? They had false expectations. They were mixed up. We were hoping. We were trusting. But they had a false view of the Messiah that they were hoping for. These men are ignorant of the Bible. We were hoping that he would redeem Israel, save us from the Romans, restore us, of us as a mighty nation again. But a dead king can't do that. What's lacking here is a clear understanding of the Bible. Now, thankfully, that's not required for salvation. Be glad. But folks, it is required for peace. If you want peace in your life, you must have a clear and accurate understanding of the scripture or you're going to have false expectations. We see the spiritual condition of these men. And right now it's not good. All right, verse 22 and 23. But they're still talking. But also some women among us amazed us when they were at the tomb early in the morning and did not find his body. They came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Now notice, they're rejecting the very clear testimony of the women. They're rejecting that. Verse 24. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just exactly as the women had also said. But him they did not see. So we have two men... They're discouraged, they're disappointed, and they're letting it all out. Now, he does a pretty good job of recalling the facts. Now, I ask you a question. As far as Jesus being a counselor here, does Jesus reject them? No, he does not reject them. But the longer the man talks, the more he shows is unbelief. Look at all the evidence that he's overlooking. The witnesses, the empty tomb, the grave clothes, the angels, what the angels have to say. Do we need to just stop and let that go by? <laughs> I don't know what that is either. I've never heard that sound before. Look at all the evidence that these men are overlooking. The witnesses, the empty tomb, the grave clothes, the angels, the message of the angels. People saw Jesus. They heard him speak. These men could have saved themselves a lot of pain if they had believed the Bible. If they knew their Bible and if they believed the Bible, they could have saved themselves a lot of pain if they believed the Bible and they had believed the evidence that God gave them. These men are about this close to giving up. Now, maybe that's where you are today. Maybe you're discouraged and you're down and you're close to giving up. Now, we, we could be the same, time, same way sometimes. But notice, once Jesus comes into the conversation, these men have hope. Now, the application for us, what problem are you dealing with today? What, what are you struggling with? Once Jesus comes into the conversation, we have hope. Now, how does Jesus come into our conversation? He comes in by the scripture. He comes in through God's word. When you're reading your Bible, Jesus is going to enter the conversation with you, and the Holy Spirit is going to apply that scripture to your issue, whatever that may be. But you can't expect to find the answer outside of scripture i will go so far as to say this the bible has the answer to every problem you will ever deal with in your life do you believe that do you doubt that whatever you're dealing with today the bible has the answer to your problem and i challenge you if you don't think that's true Send me your problem. If any of you are listening on the internet today, send me your problem. Send me an email, Mr. Stephen Hill at AOL.com. 
MR, Stephen EV, Mr. Stephen Hill at AOL.com. I will get back to you within 48 hours. If you think you have a problem and the Bible does not have the answer to your problem, let me know. Now, as you know, on Sunday nights, we're dealing with our series on culture. And we're dealing with wokeness and things like that. And wokeness is creeping into the Christian church. And wokeness is telling us that the Bible has a lot of answers to a lot of problems, but it does not have the answer to racism. Now, folks, if that's true, you might as well throw your Bible away. You might as well stay home and sleep in on Sunday morning. The Bible has the answer to every problem you will face. So wokeness is telling us you're born a racist, you'll always be a racist, you'll die a racist, and there's nothing you can do about it. So just give money to the cause and work, and it's a works-based salvation. And you'll never earn your salvation because there's no answer. If that's true, then it means the Bible doesn't have the answer, then we might as well stop right now. So if you think you have a problem that the Bible cannot answer, I want you to email it to me, and I will get back to you within 48 hours. So Jesus joins the conversation. He has the answer, and notice how these men are just pouring out their problems to a total stranger about what happened that day. It's the third day, so now it's, it's just too late. Yet, some people have said he's alive. These men are only seeing the facts of the empty tomb. They're not seeing the application of of the empty tomb. Now the word gospel means good news. And folks there's no good news. If, unless Jesus is raised from the dead. So what leads these men to be hopeless? Look at verse 25. And I want to read it very slow. And he said to them. O oh, foolish men. And slow of heart to believe. In all that the prophets have spoken. Foolish Slow of heart. Now, foolish means simple one, uh, clueless, dull. These men should have known better. Probably these men are part of the 120 that was gathered while Jesus was crucified. So these men should know better. They're like little children who failed to understand, and now Jesus corrects them. Now, anytime you're in a counseling situation and you're dealing with a friend who has a problem, if they're going this way and that's the wrong way, sooner or later, you've got to bring them back and help them get on the right track. That's what Jesus is starting to do now. But notice how he uses the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Now, the problem with these men isn't their head. The problem is is in their hearts. Listen to verse 38, which is not part of our text. And he said to them, Why are you troubled? Why do doubts arise in your hearts? I could substitute my name there. How many times would Jesus say to you or to me, Why are you troubled? Why do doubts arise in your heart? They are slow of heart to believe. Slow to believe in the prophets, slow to believe in the Bible. These men are close. They're close. They're so close here, but they're not there yet. Now, so Jesus' job is to correct their perspective. They're going this way. Now this good counselor needs to bring them back this way. They need a fresh look at God's word, and that's what Jesus is going to give them. He's going to open the Bible them to them, and then he's going to open their eyes. Now, I want you to notice, they find their hope. He gives them their hope in God's word, not from Freud. The worldly methods, the counseling methods of the world are not going to give you hope. You're not going to do it. You will find your hope in God's word when the Holy Spirit opens your eyes and lets you see what he has for you in God's word. He's going to show these men the real Messiah. He wants them to be able to see 
correctly. So now he's going to correct them. So he could say, you guys are ignorant of the clues in the Old Testament. The Old Testament points to Jesus. So as you're reading for your, through your devotions in the Old Testament, you need to be looking for Jesus. Lord, Holy Spirit, show me Jesus in this passage. Because Jesus is on every page in the Old Testament. The Messiah had to suffer to save his people. They didn't understand that. The Jews struggled to understand the Old Testament. Would there, be, would there be two Messiahs? One that suffered, one that wore a crown and ruled as a king. So Jesus starts to walk them through the Old Testament. There can only be one Messiah who will suffer and then reign as a king. But notice again, Jesus bases everything on the Bible. Nothing else. Also, it's interesting. He doesn't correct them for not believing the women. He corrects them for not believing the Bible. They're reading their Bibles and they're only seeing what they want to see. They see a crown. They don't see a cross. They don't see suffering or a crisis. All right, let's go to verse 26. Jesus said, was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and to enter into his glory? Necessary. He's saying, guys, this had to be. There's a principle here. We suffer first and then there's glory. We suffer first and then there's glory. So, guys, you got it wrong. You thought the cross was the end the cross is the beginning. It's the beginning of hope, not just the end. There's no room in their Bible for a suffering Messiah. All right, verse 27. Now, this is why the other pastor I talked to wanted to be in this passage at this point in time. Verse 27. Then beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. Folks, what a Bible lesson. Can you imagine what that would have been like? He's going to show them how full the Old Testament is of Jesus Christ. He begins with Moses. He walks through the prophets. Then he would, could go into the New Testament and show them how it all ties together. Verse 28, and they approached the village where they were going, and he acted as though he were going further. Now here we are talking about, a, uh, we're going to get to it in a minute, a doctrine that has almost disappeared from the modern church, but we're not there yet. So let's read it again. Verse 28, they approached the village where they were going. He acted as though he was going further. So here's the question. Jesus wants you to want more of him. How much of Jesus do you want? Will they let Jesus keep going? Well, thank you very much. We, we enjoyed our conversation. Nice to have met you. How much of Jesus do you want? He was going to go on, no pressure. So have you men had enough of me? Do you want more of me? How about you today? Have you had enough of Jesus or do you want more of Jesus? How much do you want? He will not push you. But he's there. If you want more, he'll give it to you. He'll give you as much as you want. He wants us to prove our love for him. Let me give you a great example of that. Uh, it's found in Genesis chapter 33. Uh, 33 verse 26 uh, 32 verse 26, as we're dealing with Jacob. Now, there's no doubt about it. Jacob was a rascal. No doubt. His life, whoo, boy, you study the life of Jacob, you're, you're dealing with a guy who's messed up. But now he's getting his life together. And in this passage, he's, he's wrestling with a man. Now, we think the man is Jesus, the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ. He's wrestling with Jesus. And he wrestled with him until daybreak. When he saw that he had not prevailed against him, he, that he touched the socket of his thigh. So the socket of Jacob's thigh was dislocated while he wrestled with him. Now, 
What does this rascal who's getting his life straightened out have to say in verse 26? Then he said, the, the man said, let me go for the dawn is breaking. But he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Jacob's getting his life straightened out and he wants more of Jesus. I will not let you go. Where are you today? Have you had enough of Jesus or do you want more? Will you not let him go? Will you let him walk on to another town or another location? Or will you stop him? So in verse 29, we're dealing with the doctrine, hospitality, which has just about disappeared from the American culture and from the Christian church. Verse 29. But they urged him, saying, Stay with us, for it's getting towards evening, and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. Finally, now he has reached their hearts with the word of God. And they don't even know his name. He's a stranger. They're saying to a total stranger, stay with us. Don't leave. Stay with us. What do we learn from this? God's word breaks down barriers. Sin creates barriers. God's word breaks them down. Any barrier you have in your life is because of sin. And the answer is God's word can break it down. We have hospitality here. They invited these strangers to stay with them. Stay with us. Now, in the Greek, it has the idea of force. So they're not just saying, we well, can stay with us if you like. It's as if they're saying, they're grabbing him by the shoulder and saying, no, you will stay with us. Now, hospitality, it's almost gone from the Christian church today. So this is a great encouragement to help us get back on track. All right, verse 30. When he had reclined at the table with them, he took the bread and he blessed it. And breaking it, he began giving it to them. Now, I don't think this is the Lord's Supper. I think this is a, a normal dinner, a meal. 31. Then their eyes were open, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. You can see it. How? What? Why? Ah. Did they see his hands as he broke the bread and as he gave it to them? Did they see his hands? Is that what caused their eyes to be open? God opens her eyes, and as soon as her eyes are open, boom, he's gone. He disappeared. Then they instantly connect all the dots. Jesus, Messiah, suffering Savior, risen King. It starts to come together. So, folks, a proper understanding of the Bible gave them hope. You need hope today? We all do. In this world that we live in, we need hope. One writer said, once their spiritual eyes were open, Jesus became invisible to their physical all right, verse 32. They said to one another, were not our hearts burning within us while he was speaking to us on the road, while he was explaining the scriptures to us, burning hearts. Bible knowledge should lead to a burning heart. Bible knowledge should lead to a burning heart. Then a burning heart, that knowledge should lead to a greater walk with Jesus. So how can we today on Easter Sunday hear the story of a risen Christ and still have a cold heart? How can we do that? He explained the scriptures to us. That's what they said. Now, preaching is explaining and applying, explaining and applying through personality. That's what preaching is. But again, what gave these men peace? What Jesus did for these men is what he wants to do for you and what he wants to do for me. We can't help people with their problems without explaining the Bible. That's where they're going to find their hope and their encouragement. In this world that we live in today, you can't turn on the television without being disappointed. You can't listen to anything without being discouraged today. We all need this, folks. We need to be in church with one another as many times as we can get there. 
to encourage one another, lift each other up, build each other up, share the burdens that we have with one another. The experience that these men went through, the Holy Spirit is ready to meet you today wherever you are. Jesus visited them and they were not expecting it. And the Holy Spirit will visit you when you're down and when you, when you need it. The Holy Spirit will be there for you when your wife or husband leaves you. When a loved one dies, a good friend dies, when you lose that job that was your career, you were looking forward to it for the rest of your life, and now it's gone. He'll be there when life doesn't make sense for you. So at first, these men saw the cross as the end. But once Jesus opened their eyes and they understood their Bible, then they realized that the cross was just the beginning. At first, he's alive. I don't believe it. Now they have a story. And what a story they have. Now they're excited. Can you imagine over the rest of their life, great granddaddy, tell me that story one more time. I'll be glad to do it. Let's go to 33. So they got up that very hour, returned to Jerusalem. They found gathered together the eleven and those who were with them. One man said, a burning heart will lead us to share what we have with others. A burning heart will lead us to share what we have with others. Now, it's late in the day. It's probably 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock at night, but they don't care. Forget about sleeping. They don't need to sleep. They can sleep tomorrow. They're excited. They don't care if it's dark. They don't care if it's seven miles back. They don't care about robbers and thieves. Man, we got to go. We got to tell the guys about this. It's the same road. They were traveling one way, discouraged and depressed. Now they're on the same road going the other way, and they're excited. They have a story they want to share. They're going back to Jerusalem with a different attitude, and they're rejoicing. 34. Saying, the Lord has really risen. And has appeared to Simon. Now, there's, if there's no resurrection, folks, there's no Christianity. That's how important this is. If there's no resurrection, there's no gospel, there's no good news. But the, by the time they get there, Jesus has appeared to Peter and some other people. By right, verse 35. They began to relate their experiences on the road and how he was recognized by them in the breaking of the bread. Now, you can see Jesus like these two men. They saw Jesus as he was breaking the bread, a regular meal. Learn to see Jesus in the everyday things of your life. A meal, breakfast, lunch, dinner. All right, application, I'm about done. Okay. Where are you today? Right now, Jesus knows where you are. You, he knows you inside and out. He knows you better than you know yourself. He knows you better than the deacons and elders here know you. So you might as well just pour out your heart to him. That's what he wants you to do. Tell him about your problems. Tell him about your struggles. He wants you to do that. He knows your spiritual temperature. He knows right now if you're hot or cold. He wants to help you with it. He wants to meet you where you are today. Jesus wants to light a fire in your heart. Do you want that? Do you want the Lord to light a fire in your heart? One man said something, and it, it's an overstatement, but it's, it's a truth, and I want us to get at the root of it. He said, We Christians don't need more head knowledge. We need more fire. And we can always use more head knowledge, okay? But his point is, the head knowledge that you have, has it lit a fire in you spiritually? Are you on fire for the Lord? We need more fire. Another point of application. Do you want to talk to other Christians about Jesus. These men couldn't wait to get back and talk to their fellow believers about Jesus. We need to learn from these two men. Talk about Jesus when you walk, which is what they did. I'm going to close with one verse. 
And Deuteronomy uh, chapter 6, you know it well. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 7. Now, this is, this is written to parents and how to raise children, how to raise Christian children. But it applies to all of us in every area of our lives. So Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 6. These words which I am commanding you today. Now, so it's not a request. This is a command from the Lord. These words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. Okay, what are those words? You shall teach them diligently to your sons and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand. And they shall be as frontals on your forehead. You shall write them on your doorpost of your home and on your gates. What's he saying? Whether it's raising children, living the Christian life, it is a 24-hour-a-day joy. And we should be talking about the Lord, and when something comes up in our lives and it's a problem, it's a struggle, how do children learn? One way they learn is by hearing you sitting around a kitchen table talking about the problem, talking about what the Bible has to say about it, and how the Bible applies to that problem. That's what your children and your grandchildren need to hear from all of us. Praise God, Jesus is risen. Happy Easter. Let's pray.